many know we have authority over the devil? Well, I've been talking about that the last two weeks and uh, may end that this week. We'll see how it goes today. But I just want to talk again about exercising your Jesus-given authority over Satan. It's so important now. We're in a spiritual uh, battle, the likes of which I've never seen in my lifetime worldwide. You've got to understand the bigger scope of things is Jesus is coming back. How many believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? Now, he's coming in the rapture of the church at some point, and then the second coming comes after that. Some people believe, I don't happen to believe this, I did for 25 years and preached it that way, that the rapture is going to whisk us away before the seven years people typically uh, call the tribulation. I don't see that in Scripture now, and I can prove it, and you can go back in our archives and listen to what I've had to say. I've had a lot to say about that. If that does happen on the way up, I'll say I was wrong. But if, in fact, uh, what I've seen in Scripture is correct, we're going to be here for a few years into that. And then before the worst come, before the wrath of God comes, we get, we get to get out of here. How many think that's good news? And then we come back with Jesus in His second coming to defeat the person, uh, the man of lawlessness, the Bible calls Antichrist in the book of 1 John. And uh, anyway, all that stuff seems to be assimilating together. Uh, the belief system there is from the book of Revelation, from the book of Daniel, there'll be a man that uh, seeks to control the whole world politically, financially, um, and, and uh, religiously. And those things, those schemes are underneath the surface working out. Those ideologies are in the world today. How many hear what I'm saying? So the challenges we face in our, our nation you know, there's just huge deception in the political realm. I, I don't like to say these things, but they're true. And uh, we've, had, we've got a lot of leaders that are paid under the table to keep their mouths shut and let things progress the way they're going. How many hear me? So if you're a wise person, you'll pray. How many hear me? Now, people, some people call me a cons conspiracy theorist. Well, then the Bible is a full of conspiracies then. Jesus is coming back, and the world is going that direction. I uh, don't see it getting a lot better, but I do see revival coming before Jesus comes back and people getting saved. So as by fire, just, just before the worst hits, they get saved, and we all go up in the rapture of the church. How many are excited about that? Until then, we got to live life. We got to pay our bills, take our kids to school. We got to do, we got to pay our mortgage. We got to cut our grass. You got to, you got to keep your house up. You got to do the natural things you got to do, right? God never called us to hold our head, uh, put our head in the sand and act like nothing bad is not happening. No, some awful things are happening. The good news is we're on the winning team. And thank God we have authority over the devil in our personal lives in the name of Jesus. So, you know, we are in a tremendous warfare. And people that aren't talking about that, you know, they're doing you a disservice. I'm a pastor. I love you. So I just want you to understand some really nasty things are coming, and we need to get ready for them. How many hear me? The best way to prepare is get your heart right with Jesus. Seek God's face with all of your heart. Get your life cleaned up and say, Jesus, use me to minister life to somebody else. Here's what I know. If I keep my eyes off of me and put my eyes on Jesus, number one, and then put my eyes on ministering life to others, number two, we're going to be all right through this thing how many hear me the moment you get your eyes on you and the way things could have been should have been would have been used to be forget all that that ain't coming back jesus is coming back and we need to get ready for that right so uh this series small series just about our authority over the enemy been talking about that the last uh, uh two sundays october 30th uh go back and listen all the archives are on the uh, website as well as the notes the notes for today are also on the website uh, you know, I, I just kind of hodgepodge, hit and miss sometimes. I feel like I'm probably going to do that today. Some things that God's already laid in my heart, not in my notes. Nonetheless, October 30th, I talked about uh, Satan's origin, um, Isaiah um, uh, 14 and then Ezekiel 28. Give us the origin of Satan. We don't know a lot about his past, but we do know enough about our enemy to understand when he's working and how to resist him. We do understand that he was a beautiful being created by God. His name was Lucifer in heaven. Uh, he got lifted up because of his pride, because of his beauty, because of in his intelligence, and because of the wisdom that God had given him. And he decided to, uh, to create a, an insurrection against God in heaven that did not work. A third of the angels did follow him, and uh, he slurred God's name. He gossiped against God, and uh, he tried to pit. And that's what Satan does. He divides so he can conquer. How many hear me? So anybody that comes to you talking about your boss, talking about your company, talking about your pastor, talking about your friend behind their back, you need to tell them uh, in Jesus' name and in love, just shut up. 
And don't listen to them. Don't have bucket ears, you know, because they have a potty mouth. And that's what happened to Satan. We talked about that. Um, uh, he loves the sensual. He loves the beautiful. He loves music. And uh, he loves to dominate and control. And so when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he fell to the earth. When he fell to the earth, here two things happened. He broke fellowship. Uh, he, he lied to Adam and Eve. And they bought his lie and, um, and listened to him, broke their fellowship with God. And, and, then, and then another unusual thing happened, and that's what we're talking about in this series. When God originally created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, he gave them an ability to fellowship with him because we are spiritual beings created in the image of God. God scooped our bodies from the dust the dirt, and then breathed into our nostrils. The Hebrew word is ruach, and it just means <sighs> he breathed something of himself into us. And so unlike any part, other part of creation, we have an ability to fellowship with an unseen God. And isn't that awesome? And we are attuned to a spiritual realm. We are spiritual beings. God is a spirit, Jesus said in John chapter 4. So we have a capacity to fellowship with the God of heaven. Isn't that awesome? Second thing that God did for us when he created us, he gave some of his all authority overseeing all of the universe. He gave some of that all authority to humankind so that we could help oversee the earth under his control, under his oversight, over his, uh, under his authority. And so, uh, and he gave that to us and, and that we talked about that last week very clearly um, that God gave uh, Adam and Eve, looks like a time limited dominion over the earth we talked about that go get the archives to listen to the details of that but the sad thing that happened when adam and eve sinned two things happened number one they broke fellowship with god and we are sinners by nature how many hear me that little baby that coos and, and you go ah and ooh over so sweet that baby has a fallen heart that baby is wicked at the heart, and as that baby ages, the self-centeredness that you see and understand, it's the, it's the frailty of the human heart. We're, de, we're deceitful above all things. Our hearts are and desperately wicked. How many hear me? That's not comforting when you got kids, babies, and when you got grandchildren. I got eight of them, but I know all of them need to come to Jesus like I did. Yes or no? I have to say these things. Who in our culture is telling us we're bad to the bone? No, they're telling us good, we're just good, you're just real good. No, you're not, you're a stinker without Jesus. Yes or no? Adam sinned. Second thing that happened was the authority that God gave Adam and Eve. And this, if you understand this, it makes sense of the jigsaw puzzle of life. When Adam and Eve sinned, not only did they break fellowship with God and were catapulted into spiritual darkness, but the second thing that happened was the authority God gave them to oversee the earth was given away to God's arch enemy, Satan. It's a terrible thing to even mention. I don't even like to have to say it, but it's absolutely true. Jesus called him, uh, John 14, 30, the prince of this world. Paul called Satan, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age. 1 John 5, 19 mentions the, the whole earth. Those that don't know Jesus are under the sway or the control of the evil one, Ephesians 6. We don't wrestle against human beings, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's a hierarchy of demon power that pretty much surrounds the earth like a dark cloud. I know it's foreboding to talk about these things, but this is the, this is the climate that we live in. And so what, when Jesus came, two things happened. Jesus was, how many know it, the God-man? Yes or no? He was 100% God, 100% man, because, and we'll talk about this during Christmas, but because, uh, because Jesus had no earthly father, that made his blood pure. The blood comes from the man. God, God's blood dwelled in Jesus' body. Jesus was the Son of God in human form. Isn't that awesome? He was the incarnation. God made flesh. And because of that, Satan had no jurisdiction over him. He never sinned. And he was born with authority over the devil, unlike all of us. We are under Satan's jurisdiction, and, and he has, a, he has a, a, a right to oppress and produce fear and to wreak havoc on the human life. Jesus said he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? 
And so, but the good news is Jesus, when he became a man and then uh, had his ministry for, for three and a half years and then died, Jesus, number one, became our sin, was judged for our sin, was raised from the dead when God was satisfied, our sin debt was paid, and he made us right with God. Whoo! Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Right? Second thing Jesus did, I am he that lives and was dead, he said to John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 1.18, and I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys. Keys represent authority of hell and death. Jesus at his ascension, uh, he appeared to his disciples for 40 days and then he ascended to heaven. Just before he ascended, he made this unusual statement and there's reasons he did this. He said, all authority is given unto me both in heaven and on earth. Jesus has already obviously talked to the disciples about taking their sins, being raised from the dead, then being free, then being born again and, and all of the things that the prophets were the foretype and, the, and, and they talked about in the Old Testament. Jesus was the fulfillment of and their hearts burned within them on the Emmaus road as Jesus spoke to them about the things of God but there and on the Mount of Ascension Jesus said all authority is given unto me both in heaven and on earth he didn't say that as the son of God he said that as, as, as a man as a resurrected human being that had conquered death that had conquered Satan that had actually took Satan's authority from him that he took from Adam and Eve when they sinned that came from God and gave it back to you. You know, you can't, you can't talk low when you're talking about these things. How many hear me? It gets exciting. It feels like a pressure cooker on the inside. So we talked about that last week. So Jesus has given us a delegated authority. He's given us back the authority that Satan stole. I want to make this as practical as I can today. So last week, we talked about the delegated authority that Jesus gave the church the body of Christ. Now, this is a, a, a challenge to say, but it's true. The only people who have authority over demonic things worldwide are people who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and who are educated as to our authority. Ignorant people, ignorant people can't, can't help you. If you're ignorant about who you are in Christ and a large portion, sadly, of the body of Christ don't realize they, have to, they need to exercise authority over the devil. Let me tell you how he is. He won't leave you alone till you make him go. Smith Wigglesworth, who was an English evangelist, was walking down the street. He saw a man walking down the street one day. And you know those little dogs that they're, they're about uh, a thousand times bigger on the inside than they are on the outside? You can call them what you want. I have words for them. But you know, that little dog was following him, you know, following behind him, just, nah, 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 you know how they do. And they just act like they're King Kong, you know. Burr, 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 burr. And the guy said, now go on, go back home. Burr, 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 trying to nip at his heels. And, and the dog just kept walking. And finally, Smith Wigglesworth said, the man turned around, got fed up with the dog and said, I said, get. Yeah! And the dog run back home. And he said, that's how you have to do the devil. If you placate him and do nothing, he's going to keep aggravating you and nipping at your heels. You've got to take authority over him. How many hear what I'm saying? A lot of people are oppressed, depressed, and full of fear and this and that because they, they have authority. They just do nothing with it. You can't be an innocuous believer and make it. Today, you've got to exercise your God-given authority. How many hear me? Uh, we remove our spiritual clothes when we choose as a believer to, to live in sin. You know, if you sin, how many know you need to judge the sin and ask God to forgive you and help you overcome the desire to do whatever it is that separates you from fellowship with Jesus? A believer in sin, they're taking their spiritual clothes off. They're, they've taken off the armor of God spoken of in Ephesians chapter 6 and they're laying it on the ground. And when the enemy looks at you in the spirit realm, you're naked spiritually. How many hear me? And then your badge, your spiritual badge of authority. We've got a badge of authority like a police officer has and we lay that dude down on the ground when, when, we, when we choose not to walk with God and act like the culture around us. Yes or no? So that's all last week and the week before. Today, I want to do this. I got uh, uh, two goals. I, I, I want you to encourage you to build your faith up in your authority in Christ. How many know you need to build your faith up in every area of life? Yes or no? I keep my faith built up in answered prayer because I pray a lot. I keep my faith built up in, uh, in, in divine healing. 
And if you weren't here uh, Wednesday night, I talked about healing being part of the gospel, uh, a part of Jesus' sacrifice for us. He not only forgave our sins, but made provision for the healing of our physical bodies. How many hear me? So you got to keep your faith built up in that, or it just won't work. And most believers don't know that Jesus took their sicknesses when he took their sins, and so they have no idea they can trust God to help them overcome sickness, disease, and all these things when they come. Wednesday night I talked about that in detail. Go check that out. But the other thing that's really important is to exercise your authority in Christ. You need to build your faith up in the fact that Jesus gave you authority over your enemy. Now, me... When I came to the Lord, I came to the Lord just before my 18th birthday. And like, you know, kids growing up in the 60s and 70s, I watched the horror movies and the horror flicks. And, and you know, I thought it was spooky and wonderful. I played with a Ouija board. I bought, listen, this is awful to tell you, but I bought witchcraft books from my public library and from the library in my school. How many hear me? And I figured out how to put hexes and stuff on people. And it's just ridiculous. This is awful to tell you. But you know, Jesus had to, he forgave me for all that. But because I had that kind of background, see. And let me just take an aside journey here. Can I talk about this a minute? If you've ever been involved in the occult, or if you read your horoscope every day, you need to repent before God. You became a marked person in the realm of the spirit when you messed with the demonic. Go to read Leviticus 18. It's really clear. Don't have anything to do with anything from the demonic world. We laugh at witches and white witches and all the funny stuff they do, and it's just so much fun. And that's what our young people are getting involved in these days, my friend. You become a marked person in the realm of the spirit. And demon spirits will search you out and bring melancholia, depression, oppression, fears, sicknesses, diseases, calamities, disaster. Oh, he'll pull you in thinking it's a lot of fun to start with. The end result is hell on wheels. Did you hear me? So if you've ever been involved in any of that, you just need to repent. There was a day in my life I said, God, Jesus is Lord of my life. I'm 18 years old. I understand where I've been and what I did in my B.C. days, my before Christ days. I repent of all that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Forgive me for all of that mess I allowed myself to get involved in in the demonic realm. I repent of it in the name of Jesus and ask you to cleanse me. And I shut the door in the name of Jesus. No devil has any authority over me ever from my ancestors ancestry, from my background, from my past, from the things I've involved myself in. You get away from me. You have no authority over me anymore in Jesus' name. And I got a little sign up, no trespassing. So I had to, when I came to Jesus, I had to build up my faith in the fact that Jesus has authority over the enemy. Because you know, you watch enough Hollywood and you know, if there's a devil in the room, the, the priest is trying to exercise the devil. He's just scared as he can be and his knees are knocking and he's getting thrown against the wall and, you know, and then, and then the person that's got the devil, they're scaring everybody in the room and this person, this happened to this person, that's happening to that person. If you got that kind of stuff in your head, you need to get delivered from it. I know that's a little bit dramatic, but you get what I'm saying, right? So I had to build myself up in who I was in Christ. So the following scripture, y'all ready for this? I've got several scriptures that I've used. I'm going to go through this quickly because I will end with something that's really important in the light of everything I'm saying here. Notice these scriptures. And I mentioned this last week, Luke 10, 19. This is pre-cross. Jesus gave his disciples the authority of the use of his name. And when they said, in the name of Jesus, it was as though Jesus himself were there. And he was speaking. And the devils would the devils would recognize that name just as if Jesus was there. And he does the same thing with you. Is that good news? So he said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, demons and evil spirits, what that's a reference to, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then uh, after the cross, the apostle Paul talking to the church in Corinth Man, when he's talking about uh, signs, wonders, miracles, the demonstration of the power of God and the wisdom of God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, I didn't just come with eloquence of speech, but with the power of God backing up what I say. And then in the middle of all that, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 2, there's a hidden gem there. And it says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. They're talking about full-grown believers, yet not the wisdom of of this age then he says nor of the rulers of this age now he's not speaking 
when he says the rulers of this age, he's not talking about the current, the current uh, person overseeing the Roman Empire of the time or a, a king or a, an authority over a, a certain domain. He's talking about demon spirits in the spirit realm, nor of the rulers of this age, the demon forces. I, he's, he's referencing literally the uh, Ephesians 6, the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness and high prices that we have to resist in Jesus' name, right? That we wrestle against, nor of the rulers of this age. And then that last phrase, I want to I bounce off of that. Who are coming to nothing. Demon spirits are coming to nothing. Now, I've got this in the, I've got a wide, couple of several wide margin Bibles. I've used a wide margin Bible in the 80s, the 90s, and now I mostly use my iPad, and I've transferred it all to different things. But I wrote all these verses down, and I meditated on them a lot in my young years, and I still do, but they fomented in me a confidence in God that wherever I am and whatever I'm facing, I have a Jesus-given authority over the enemy. How many hear me? And you need to know that because, you know, when you're ministering life to people and sharing Jesus with people as we all should be, yes or no? You're sharing Jesus with people? And when God knows that you won't, you'll be bold and you won't close your mouth, you'll open your mouth and share Jesus and pray with people, I mean, you become a target to the enemy. But you need to know that you have authority over him. So when he tries to hinder you, you say, uh-uh, not today and not ever. You better go mess with somebody else that doesn't know who they are because I know who I am. Get out. So he says here, nor of the rulers of this age who were coming to nothing. Amplified translation of that last phrase. So let me play off that last phrase, who were coming to nothing. Everybody say, who were coming to nothing. Amplified says, who were being brought to nothing and doomed to pass away. I really like that one. And then the Weast New Testament, who were coming to nothing, says, who are in the process of being liquidated. You know, when a business closes its doors, it has a liquidation sale. That means everything's got to go. That means the authority of the enemy is, is, is not getting stronger, it's getting weaker. But he's still going to try to bring the Antichrist on the scene and make a mess of the nations of the world before Jesus comes back. Young's literal translation, again, who are coming to nothing, of those becoming useless. Demon power eventually will become useless. Is that good? Moffat's translation mentions it, the dethroned powers that rule this world. Now see, that's a, that's a good way to look at it. They're dethroned. Satan and demonic forces are dethroned. The fears that try to hinder your life are dethroned. The demons that bring sickness and illness are dethroned. The challenges they try to bring to your person are dethroned. Now, he's got a legal right to be here until Jesus comes back. He being Satan and his emissaries, he's got a legal right to be here. But when the second coming of Christ comes, he's out the door. In fact, he's in the lake of fire. He doesn't want that to happen. There's nothing he can do from stopping it from happening. So he's dethroned. And while he's dethroned, we as believers have got to be willing to rise up and exercise the Jesus-given authority that Jesus has placed in our lives. Yes or no? wherever we are and exercise authority over him. He's dethroned, but he's got a right to be there. Kind of like, okay, we have elections in November. Uh, you know, we just had the midterm elections. We have presidential elections, et cetera, and you have local elections and such. Well, you know, you have an election day, well, second Tuesday or first Tuesday in November. And so then, you know, a person is elected and then there's one there that is in office, but you know they're leaving office. Well, they're still in office from November until sometime in January when the other person takes their place. Is that true? And they can still pass laws and do legislation and do the stuff they did. But they know eventually they're going to have to leave because they've been voted out. Well, well, Satan has been voted out. He's been dethroned. Does that make sense? And so you just got to understand he's got a legal right to be here. And we have to exercise authority over him until Jesus comes back. Jesus didn't say go crawl in a hole, cover yourself with stuff so nobody can see you. He said occupy until I come. That means stand your ground and don't give in to the enemy. Don't act like the culture around you. Colossians 1.13 says this, The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness. Let me read that again. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us. 
into the kingdom of the son of his love. Satan comes to you with doubt, fear, all those thoughts, all that mess. Say, oh, I've, I've gotten a transfer. Thank you. I've gotten a transfer. I've, I've been transferred. Uh, you can't mess with me. I'm transferred out of your company. I'm in a new company. I'm in the new creation company. I'm in the company of the Lord Jesus. Yes or no? Then Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. I've got a bunch. I think I'll just read a few of these because I've got another direction I don't want to go. I have uh, meditated a lot on Colossians 2, 2, 15. So since I mentioned meditation, everybody say meditate. Now, I don't meditate by getting on the floor, crossing my knees, sticking my palms up in the air with my fingers a certain thing, going, nah, 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 nah. You're ignorant if you do that. And if you take yoga classes and they tell you to clear your mind, say, I'll never clear my mind. I'm keeping my mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Huh? They want you to clear your mind so demons can come and oppress your mind. I would never listen to that. I say, you need to take that thought and go jump in the lake because I'm not doing that. Not today, not ever. No, no, no. I meditate. That means I take the Word of God and I let it slowly revolve over and over inside of me. The whole Scripture, sometimes portions of Scripture. I just let them keep going over and over inside of me. So the following Scriptures I've meditated on a lot. That is, they revolved around inside of me. The Apostle Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Colossians 3.16. So that's what you're doing. You're letting the word of God go over and over inside of you. So I've meditated on this a lot, Colossians 2.15. Everybody okay? I got a lot to say, so I'm covering it quick. Colossians 2.15, in this way, he, Jesus, disarmed, everybody say disarmed, the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. I like that. He disarmed the spiritual rulers. When Satan comes, do you understand? He has been disarmed, but you've got to exercise your authority or it won't work, right? I'll bring some clarity in a moment. Uh, New King James Version of Colossians 2.15 says this, having disarmed, use that word disarmed again, principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, amplifies a little clearer, God disarmed the principalities and powers that were ranged against us and made a bold display and public example of them in triumphing over them in him, in Christ and in it, the cross. Message paraphrase, I like this one. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross. Isn't that good? Then marched them naked through the streets. And, you know, armies of yesteryear, Bible times, they would take, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, they would take the enemy, uh, strip all of their armor off, strip their clothes off all the way down to their butt naked, and then march them through the streets. And then everybody scowls at, at them and laughs at them. Ha, 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 you thought you were so big and tough. And look at you, you naked. Now what you doing now? You're nothing. You're nothing, right? So he stripped all the spiritual tyrants. So that's what Jesus did to the devil and demon spirits. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. I love that. God's word translation, he stripped the rulers and authorities of their power and made a public spectacle of them as he celebrated uh, his victory in Christ. Uh, J.B. Phillips' translation, lastly, and then having drawn the sting of all the powers and authorities ranged against us, he exposed them, shattered, empty, and defeated in his own triumphant victory. I like that one, don't you? Get those scriptures. I mean, I did your homework for you. All you got to do, get this and read it out loud. I mean, you know, you take a minute, take that pill three times a day. Well, take these three times a day, say it out loud. And say, devil, I'm putting you on notice. I have authority. Jesus has authority. The Jesus in me has authority over you. And so don't put up with the fear, the doubt, the dread, the melancholy, all the mess that seeks to come into your life, right? The illness, the sickness, and all that stuff, right? And then the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1 that we would understand the power that God has given the church. Now, I pray this for me. I pray this for you just about every day. Ephesians 1, 19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead 
and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler, authority, power, or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. The demon forces of hell. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. And then the sister part of that is Ephesians 2, 6. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. Every day I said it this morning, thank you that I'm seated with Jesus far above principality, power, might, dominion, above every demonic force. Jesus has given me authority and Lord, I'm walking in that authority today. I say it every day just to remind me, God knows it, I need to know it, and the devil needs to know it. How many hear me? Then, then I'm coming to a conclusion of this part, James 4, 7. Now this is important. James understood all this, the practical half-brother of Jesus. Therefore, he said, submit to God. Before you can ever pray any of that, you've got to be submitted to Jesus. If you allow an unconfessed sin in your life, if you're living with your boyfriend, living with your girlfriend, how many hear what I'm talking about? If you're lying and cheating and stealing, lying on your income tax, lying in your business life, telling things that you know aren't true to take advantage of other people, friend, friend you're in sin. And you need to repent, right? Uh, it's very clear. Therefore, submit to God. What's he saying there? Make sure you clean it up. Now, let, here, here's one thing God understands. How many know God understands your flesh? How many know God understands there are certain areas of life you're challenged in? And, and you know, you, you'll never be away from the flesh until you go to be with Jesus and get a glorified body. Until then, you're going to struggle with your flesh. And when your t- flesh takes authority over you, how many know you can, you can say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for yielding to the flesh. And how many know that God forgives and cleanses? And then you can pray, Lord, help me not to want to go there anymore. Help me not to do that anymore. But what you don't want to do is live in unconfessed sin. So that's the reason James said, therefore, submit to God. Clean your life up, he says. Make, make sure your conscience is clean. You're living like you know you should. Not doing things on purpose all the time without repenting things you know is wrong. How many understand? Therefore, submit to God. Then resist the devil. Everybody say resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Now that word resist, the Greek language is very expressive and sometimes one word doesn't, doesn't do it justice. So we translated Greek to English. So the Greek translations, various theologians have mentioned things about this word resist. Everybody say resist. Uh, Mr. Strong's says this, to op- resist is to oppose or withstand. Uh, that's the opposite of giving in. Is that true? Uh, Bullinger says this, set oneself against either in word or deed or both. I say both. Speak it out loud, right? Uh, this expositor Elliot says this, the devil can fight but cannot conquer you if you resist. I love that. Don't you like that? Wheaton says this, temptation when repelled disappears and when habitually kept at a distance ceases to exist. I like it. Don't you like that? And then the word flee, everybody say flee. Huh. Uh, they say this, flee uh, because of inspired fear and threaten danger. Uh, another guy says, seek safety in flight. Little and Scott says this, run off as quickly as possible. Now can't you see when you say, get in Jesus' name. Like that little dog, right? Uh, and then um, Expositor's Greek New Testament, if you resist him, he will be vanquished and will flee from you disgraced. I like it. You know, I can see a dog with his tail turned between his legs. You ever done that? Then Ephesians 4.27, lastly, nor give place to the devil. Everybody say it out loud, nor give place to the devil. God's word translation says, don't give the devil any opportunity to work. New century version, do not give the devil a way to defeat you. I like it. Weymouth's New Testament, do not leave room for the devil. Kenneth Wiest's translation of the New Testament, stop giving an occasion for acting or an opportunity to the devil. So, how many know we have authority to resist the devil? And when you yield to sin, how many know it's opposite of, you, uh, of resisting the devil? So I, I got I to bring some disclaimers here because you could misunderstand what I'm saying. Uh, uh, authority over demon spirits, 
You have authority over demon spirits and all the forces of hell arrayed against you, but you don't have authority over human spirits. There's a big difference. And I, got it, I want you to understand, so, so you don't have authority to say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, and you're talking to your boss. You're going to be on the street without a job with a pink slip in your hand. You don't have authority over your husband. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Come out of him. And he's just looking at you like, you fool. Or you do the same thing to your wife. Or your neighbor whose dog keeps pooping in your yard. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. No, they probably want it to happen. Or maybe they just made a mistake. So what am I saying? You know. Kind of a you know serious subject. Nonetheless, I, a little humor is good. Uh, you have authority in your own life, but you don't have authority over other people. How many hear what I just said? Now here's an illustration I want to cover here, and I just told them in the sound booth about this. Second Samuel 24. David did something showing that he trusted his flesh and his army more than he trusted God. He took a census of his soldiers. It upset God. God said, David, you just did the wrong thing, buddy. You're the leader. You know better. You did it anyhow. Now, now three, one of three things is going to happen. Um, your enemy, I'm, uh, you can be turned over to your enemy, or the land can, uh, you know, will we'll turn against you, or I can deal with you. And David said to Gad, the prophet, I am in great distress, 2 Samuel 24, 14. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. Now what does that tell you? Friends, you don't have authority over other people. And the authority you have in Christ is not authority over human personalities. How many heard what I just said? You know, we were at the abortion thing yesterday, uh, Love Life, and, you know, we go across uh, an abortion center and we sing and worship and pray. And, and so we were all gathered together um, before and after in a parking lot of a business uh, across the road. We had to cross, uh, cross the road to get to it. And, uh, and you know, so you got, you got some people on the other side, and they brought their kitchen pots and pans. Yeah. And so they're trying to talk and give people instruction. And... They're hitting the pots and pans. Well, the first thing I thought, those people just cuckoo. Look, look at that. What are they doing? Well, you know, they were angry and they were demonstrating. Now, you know, I could have went up to them and said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And they'd have laughed at me because they wanted to do that. Do you get the difference? The human heart is wicked and self-centered and conniving. Have you ever fall, fallen heir to that? People ever done you wrong? So you don't have authority over human spirits. So at 1980, Susan and I um, had moved to Tulsa, and, um, and we had a Sunday night free. You remember this, Susan? And Patsy Beerman, what's her last name? She got married after that. Caminetti, there you go. Patsy Beerman Caminetti was preaching one Sunday night in 1980, and we had a, they had a big old crowd there in the Rooker Memorial Auditorium. They were sitting there, you know and probably over a thousand people there and she's preaching up a storm boy and the power of God was on her and uh, she was preaching on Brother Hagin's behalf so I'm sitting there innocuously uh, were you there with me Susan or were you working she might have been working and I'm sitting there you know and then before you can say scat here comes somebody Wah! running down the aisle I know this sounds weird if you're listening I'm sorry I tend to be expressive. They're running down the aisle, and here's this guy running down the aisle, and, and, and Patsy's on the front steps, and, and he lunges at her. I mean, I mean, he's going to grab her and put her on the ground, and just before he got to her, here come the ushers. <clears throat> and boy, they got that woman in the bear hug and took her out, and she was screaming and hollering. I thought, man, man. And, and it shot me. I thought, well, I thought uh, Brother Hagin had power over the devil. Well, he does but we got some crazy humans around. And you don't have authority over their, their wills. How many understand what I'm saying? And then, and then it shot me when I started attending Ramah because Kenneth Hagin was known as a big man of faith and power and, and the power of God was on his life. But you know, I noticed he had security guards everywhere. 
And you're not about to get where you shouldn't go because they will tell you you ain't going in there. <laughs> and if you try, you'll get put out. Now, wh why didn't he just exercise authority? Because you don't have authority over human beings. You have authority over the devil. And sometimes when the enemy influences human beings, you can take authority over that. How many hear me? That's why David said, Lord, your mercies are great, but don't let me fall into the hands of man. You don't have authority over wicked people. You have authority over the demon forces that tried to hinder your life or your ministry through them. How many hear me? So here, everybody good? So here is um, Acts 13. This is, um, now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, of, of, of a false prophet, Acts 13, 6, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was uh, with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now see, it wasn't directly against Paul. They were trying to hinder Paul's ministry. That's different. Do you get that? Do you get that? Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the, uh, perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun, for a time immediately a dark mist fell on him. Whew. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now, you know, I'm just convinced there's some husbands who, that would love a dark mist to fall on their wife. And there's probably some wives who would love for a dark mist to fall on their husbands. But it don't work that way. What was the difference? The apostle Paul, uh, he was in ministry and the demon spirit's trying to hinder someone from hearing the gospel. And the gift of working of miracles came into manifestation along with the gift of faith. And that's what happened. So how many know you need, you need to watch it if you're a self-centered person and you're hindering the ministry in any way? How many hear me? So when I pray, see, I can say, devil, you take your hands off of Victory Church. Any person seeking to divide, connive, gossip, uh, bring division and all that, I bind you in Jesus' name. And then demon spirits can hinder the atmosphere. I got all kinds of stories. I just don't have much time. I want to give to all of them. Um, uh, 1994, I came here, and um, we were in an old building on Garner Road. It's still there. It's built in 1884. I was the first pastor to have an um, a, a office in the church, and it, the building was, a, a, the church had been in existence 110 years. And so I'm opening the key, opening the side door, and I heard a voice out here say, you don't belong here. Just like that, you don't belong here. Or South Carolina, Carolina speak, you don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't belong here. I said, shut up. What? And I went in the door, same thing happened the next day. I said, what is that? Then seven people came to me, independent of each other, looking both ways, saying, Pastor, don't think me crazy, but there's something in here watching us when we're here by ourselves. And then they mentioned poltergeist. You know what that is? <laughs> Rappings on the wall, tappings. Say, so something knocks on the wall when we're here by myself. And I'm just sure somebody's looking at us. I said, okay. Well, and, and seven people did that. And then one of them said, you know, um, I have something in this building. And I said, okay, what is it? And they said, well, um, Somehow we were praying and we saw something right over here and they pointed to a little extra section in the uh, auditorium. Said, it's right over there. I said, okay, well, what did it look like? And this person said, well, it looked like a bulldog <laughs> with big old eyes and big jowls like a bulldog. And here's what I noticed, these seven people, and I hadn't been here but about a month, you know, at the time, 1994. Everybody okay? And... Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so a few months later, and then here's what I noticed. Anytime I'd preach on healing and lay hands on the sick or the baptism with the Holy Spirit where the power of God would manifest, it's like the atmosphere, it's like, ew, it feels awful, like tinny, like it tightens up. I don't know how to describe it. It just felt awful. And uh, I said, wow. So we start, I started a prayer meeting in the building. And then I had a, a prophet come from Greensboro and uh Anyway, long sh the short of it, he came to our church in South Carolina when I was there. 
and preached. And, and we had some pretty amazing things happen. But he had discerning of spirits. He could see in that other world. And so I invited him to come here. I think it was March of 1995. And, uh, and I'm about to close. Everybody okay? I don't want to get the story out. Anyway, he, uh, he preached on Thursday, and that was just amazing. Then after the meeting, uh, there was a Shoney's uh, on Highway 70 right near 440, near 40, right there, yeah, 440. And that was the only place that was open late at night, and it was, my Lord, almost 11. They were about to close, and I was trying to get my butt over there before they closed. Got to, got to feed my guest speaker, and he wanted something to eat because he hadn't eaten all day. So we pulled up separately to Shoney's. I think it's now it's a Mexican restaurant or something. And I was standing on the, I was standing on the walk, sidewalk, and his wife comes up to me. And she said, Pastor Mitch, you've got poltergeist in your building, don't you? I said, who you been talking to? And she said, I hadn't been talking to anybody. And then she said this, said, uh, said, my husband saw it. His name was Clifton Sawyer. He saw it. So we sat down. I said, well, Clifton, what would you see? And he said, he said, well, it's funny. I was preaching tonight, and he said I, he, he was standing right here, you know, at the pulpit. And he said, I looked, and right over here is where those girls were talking. And he said, I looked right over there, and he pointed right where these girls pointed some months before. And he said, here's a creature, and he looked like a big bulldog with big jaws and bulging eyes. I said, who you been talking to? And he said, nobody, I saw it. Well, you know, we did some house cleaning the next day. We prayed over the building and just commanded all the demon spirits. It was a spirit of control. It tried to control the pastor. I don't have time to tell you it tried to control me, but you know, I'm kind of hard to control. <laughs> yeah. And I just wouldn't let it. So then we started having lots of prayer meetings and we cleaned all that out. I'm talking about the authority you have over the devil. How many hear me? Boy, I got a whole lot to say. Y'all want to hear more of this? I'll have to do it next Sunday if you want to because I don't have time to finish. You have authority over demon spirits. Well, we, we, uh, we rented a shopping center after that. And uh, we gave the building back to the community with some, you know, things they had to do if they wanted to have it. We actually gave the building away, and that's why God's always blessed this ministry. We gave all of our assets away. We gave a building away. Wow. And all the furnishings. Started from zero in 1996. But we were, uh, once we gave the building away, and uh, we were cleaning the building out to move into the shopping center. And, you know, it had the oak furniture, you know what I'm talking about? The, the three chairs and the in remembrance of me table, and the big oak pulpit, and then over here you got a big oak stand for flowers, and then over here on the other side of the stand you got the big stand. Well, we put we put everything back, and then we had some plastic flowers that we sat on the on the flower pedestal right here. And then when they put the second second flower back, uh, the the building had a vestibule and still had a working bell in it. Because in yesteryear, when they had church services, ring, ring, ring the bell, I put that last flower back in that same sense of oppression that was there prior to us doing spiritual business. It came right back in the door, and we had five or six guys, and one of, one of them says, mm, it feels awful in here. Then one guy, I'm not making, he ran down the aisle, grabbed the rope on the bell, ding, 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 the old charge is back. Those devils came back in that building because we left. Now, that sounds strange to you. They're territorial. Now, maybe I need, y'all want me to talk about this next Sunday? I got a lot to say about this and it'll help you out a lot. Y'all want to hear this really? I don't want to spook you out. I just want you to know you have to exercise authority. You don't have authority over people. You have authority over devils. And as a nation, we need to vote right and we need to pray because they're not going to leave just because you pray. We've got to repent of our sin. And as long as we want, as Americans, the sexual immorality, and we want all this perversion that is being taught and put on us today, as long as we want abortion and all that, those devils will stay here and laugh at you. And then judgment comes. That's why you need to pray. In your own life, you can exercise authority. I've been in some really squirrely places in the world. 
And there's demon power. And you know what? I'm just dancing in my room. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Because I'm free. Because they can be all around you but can't touch you. 